Hello everyone and welcome to this latest WFA webinar. So uh, for those of you, I think most of you are fairly aware of the WFA, but very briefly for those who are not, um, we basically represent the world's biggest brands. So now we have 90 multinationals uh, within membership as per the logo that you can see here. Uh, and also relevant to the, today's session, we uh, have 60 national advertiser associations, and in fact, two of those, ACA in Canada and AMA in the US, are going to be uh, a bit of a focus um, for today's webinar. So um, just to put faces to names, um, most of you know me, Rob, uh, in the middle, and uh, together with my colleague Natalia on the right, we're going to be ensuring that this webinar runs as smoothly as possible today. Um, some of you may already know Bill Bruno, who's our guest speaker today. Um, Bill is now the CEO of Ubiquity uh, in North America, and um, we're looking forward to hearing from him on this topic. But before we hand over to Bill, and just for a little bit more context, uh, you'll know that we have multiple forums that we run around the world, um, including our sourcing forum, uh, which we'll be meeting next month in Shanghai, um, our CMO forum, which just met last week uh, in Cannes, um, and also um, the group which is uh, most relevant, I guess, or of which this topic is highest on the agenda um, is our media forum, which you can see here meeting a while ago in London, uh, hosted by Lego. Um, and um, one, a couple of years ago, one of the sort of hot topics for this group, and uh, we created uh, this guide, the Pro um, Guide to Programmatic Media Management. And we did this together with um, uh, our members at Philips, Mastercard, Bridge Telecom, uh, Coca-Cola, GSK, and Johnson Johnson, and also um, some outside uh, support. Um, and at the time, it really served to help to drive the uh, conversation forward, if you like, and, and progress the debate. And this is the chart from that report which really garnered the most attention. Uh, and uh, forgive me if you are very familiar with this chart already, but basically what it was, it was, um, it was our uh, attempt at visualizing the money flow within the complex ecosystem of a typical programmatic media buy. Um, and we shared that the number of intermediaries involved in the typical programmatic process, which by the way often at the time was unknown to many clients, um, meant that actually the working media may be as low as 40%. So after $100 originally being invested, you may end up with $40 of working media due to the tech tax, if you like, as it's been called by many, um, which has been taken by all of those intermediaries. I should say at this point we have absolutely no issue um, with intermediaries per se. It's just really um, our feeling is that our clients um, should have full transparency in terms of the money flow, and that's really uh, the focus of today's session. Um, and since we produced uh, that guide, we've seen uh, we've seen the agenda progress further, um, and it's moved on in the sense that um, our members' models are changing. So how clients go to market with programmatic has evolved. Agency trading desks on the left. Uh, in 2013, was 81% of our members using agency trading desks. That's now still the most popular model, but um, it's not hard to spot the trend here in terms of the increase in independent uh, trading desks and also in relation to brand trading desks or hybrids, which only in 2013, so four years ago, uh, were really sort of fringe approaches, if you like, on the, on the, uh, on the margins of WFA members' approaches uh, to, to programmatic media management. And we expect that we're probably going to be seeing um, more change as well. Um, it may just be the tip of the iceberg, perhaps um, recent, most recently hearing from our members that nine in 10 of them, and that's from the 47 companies that took part in this study, are currently reviewing their programmatic models right now based on the need to, for their, they feel to improve transparency and control. So clearly, transparency remains a motivating factor for change. Um, and finally, on that area, we've also um, increasingly clients are sort of implementing fully disclosed programmatic um, desks to really mitigate against arbitrage and principal trading. Um, but initiatives such as the one that we're about to hear about today from Ubiquity and Adfin and our two national association members, so ANA in the US and ACA in Canada, are really helping to bring greater scrutiny to the typical uh, costs incurred and intermediaries involved within the programmatic process. So that's really it for me. But before I hand over to Bill, as I promised, um, we want to hand over to you. Um, and we want to do a quick 
straw poll um, of our members. I'm going to ask Natalia to launch that poll now. The question you should be seeing in front of you is um, how confident are you that you have complete and granular transparency of your pro programmatic media costs? Are you very confident? Are you quite confident? Uh, not very confident or not at all confident? Um, so if you could just register your votes, and for those who joined uh, a little bit later, um, uh, please, as we go through this, don't hesitate to post your questions on the Q&A widget that you should be seeing on the bottom right, um, and we will pose those to Bill at the um, end uh, of the session. So maybe, Natalia, if you can close that there. So um, maybe 30% saying that they are quite confident, um, the largest proportion saying not very confident, hence the reason they're joining this webinar, I imagine, and 18% um, not at all confident. So I think fairly reflective of the typical poll that we do amongst um, our WFA membership. Thank you, Natalia. Um, so now I would like to hand over to Bill Bruno. As I mentioned, uh, he is the CEO of Ubiquity in North America. Uh, Bill actually isn't a stranger to the WFA, um, having actually joined uh, a couple of our meetings in the past. And he presented, I think it was at Pernod Ricard in Paris a couple of years ago. So. With that, um, a very warm welcome back to the WFA, Bill. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate it. And thank you to all of you for making time uh, in your busy days to, to attend today's webinar. Um, you know, based on the poll, about 72% of you are either somewhat or not very confident or not confident at all. Um, and for those of you that have some level of confidence, hopefully we've got a little bit of something for all of you here to uh, help give you some action items and some things to think about when it comes to uh, trying to gain better control and transparency of your money flows through programmatic. Um, and first, I think just a very quick word about Ubiquity. Um, global independent organization. So we, all of our relationships sit on the side of the advertisers. And our goal is to, to leverage our expertise in media and marketing analytics to create clarity for all of you, um, to ultimately help you not only know where to invest your money, but to gain better transparency over how it's being invested, and then ultimately make sure that, that you're optimizing every dollar you're spending and getting the most, uh, the highest possible return from that. Um, you know, similar to our great relationship with the WFA, we work with the members and, and the global of, of many of the leading global advertiser associations. Um, you know, our focus here is to educate um, and to leverage our expertise on a global platform to try to help you know, be the driving force behind transparency um, and, and ultimately the, the better optimization of marketing dollars and investments along the way for all of you. So today's presentation will sort of fall into three parts. Uh, we'll do just a quick level setting around digital and some of the trends around programmatic. Um, and then we'll dive right into a, a high level review of the study that we launched recently. Uh, here in the U.S. marketplace that we believe has, has global implications and relevance as well uh, that we did, as, as Rob mentioned, in partnership with ADFIN, uh, the ACA, as well as the ANA. Um, and then we'll talk about what you should do next um, and, and provide you with sort of an 11-step view on, on how to proceed, you know, given the challenges uh, of programmatic, but also the, the positives of programmatic if done well. Um, and how to best capitalize on that and ensure that, that you're having a, the, the most positive investment in programmatic that you possibly can. And I think as we start to review the industry, you know, I think when we go back in time, uh, it used to be very simple. Right? As an advertiser, you'd hand money to an agency who was acting as an agent and, and buying media on your behalf in, in, in what was your best interests and, and where your, your media dollar should go, and that ultimately ended up in the hands of a publisher. But with the rise of digital, and more specifically programmatic, as, as you can see on this complicated slide here, is that it has increased in complexity significantly, um, really just over the last few years. Um, and as you think about how programmatic media is bought and, and the targeting that, that is underpinning all of those buys, at each step of the way, there's a different technology option, or I should say a handful or tens, 10 or 20 different technology options at each step in terms of, of technologies you might use to be your data management platform or a DMP. You know, the, at the, the DSP stand, from the DSP standpoint for measurement and tracking, you know, analytics, um, so on and so forth. And so not only does this complexity become a challenge 
as it pertains to following your money flows through this complicated ecosystem, but it also presents a challenge from a technology standpoint. And what you're, what you're seeing here is over 5,000 different MarTech or AdTech uh, technology vendors and suppliers that exist as of March 2016. Um, I remember when I started in the industry back in, in 2002, uh, there was about five. <laughs> so the, the level of complexity, not only in the process and, and how your money is flowing through becomes a challenge, but picking from this, this lumiscape of, of technology vendors and deciding which ones are the right fit ultimately for you based on, on your business goals and objectives really pre presents a perfect storm um, of, of decisions and, and, and a lack of transparency and, and quite a bit of confusion in terms of how to, to approach this marketplace and how to build the most effective tech stack for your business. Um, on top of that, you know, because of the rise of, of programmatic and, and just the amount of investments in digital and the number of formats and, and options that are available to you, uh, the definition of success has become quite confusing um, in terms of how you measure whether or not your investments are actually working and, and whether they were a good fit for your business. You know, traditionally, you'd look at you know, paying for ad space, right? You'd look at impressions or, or the CPM model or maybe you know, doing a land, landing page or home page takeover. Um, and buying all the real estate on, on a key landing page, you know, for your target audiences. But really, you know, that, that's not enough anymore when it pertains to success. So, as, as you've seen in the industry and, and in uh, the trade press and, and other sources, you know, there's a lot of issues around viewability and, and impressions, and, and it really doesn't signify or doesn't represent success. So as, as advertisers, as you're thinking about the campaigns, it's sort of shifting more to consumer response and, and gaining a better understanding, not necessarily of just the cost per click, but actually designating or identifying what actions um, you're, you're hoping to receive as a result of the investments you're making, maybe from a cost per lead or a cost per action standpoint. Perhaps, you know, for those in the e-commerce sector, that becomes pretty straightforward, you know, signing up maybe for a loyalty program or actually making a purchase. You know, for those in travel and hospitality, it could be, you know, booking a ticket. You know, for those that are more B2B, it might be the downloading of a brochure or signing up for some sort of, of newsletter or distribution list. But the, the key point here is, you know, this, this thought process, coming up with and defining success for your digital campaigns, is really the, the underpinning and, and the, the foundation by which you then select from that complicated list of technologies and then ultimately create better transparency of the, of the money flows for, for your particular budgets as it goes through uh, the programmatic landscape. And I think you know, it's also important to point out that some of the challenges that exist in digital are not due to transparency, but just from the rapid growth and in innovation, uh, particularly when it comes to mobile and, and video. Um, you know, from a mobile standpoint, I mean, just think about uh, how many times a day you're on your phone or the number of brands that you interact with on your phone as you scroll through, you know, your, your social media applications or, or, you know, Twitter and things of that nature. Um, and a big issue here with the mobile channel is that many technologies struggle with measurement um, and the ability to really be implemented the same way in a mobile environment as it would in a traditional web or dot-com environment. The same limitations exist in, in video. So as you think about the money flows and lack of transparency, the amount of technology that's out there, you know, and some of these limitations that happen to be in, in the most popular channels that are growing in investment, you know, this really does present a significant challenge to advertisers to to build an approach and, and try to ultimately gain better clarity in, into those money flows and, and ultimately effectiveness of, of those marketing investments. Because at the end of the day, that's really what we're talking about. You can talk about transparency. You can talk about measurement challenges. You can, you can talk about uh, money flows and taxes. But really, as marketers, what you're trying to get back to 
is the most simplistic of equations when it comes to return on investment. You want to know how much money is going in, so ultimately how much money is reaching the publishers, and you want to be able to measure success or the amount of money coming out so that you can at the most simplistic form on, uh, format understand the return on investment for every dollar that you're putting into the machine. And this problem is, isn't going to go away. You know, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm sure many of you are saying, well, duh, Bill, yeah, we get that. But you know, not only is money shifting towards digital, but specifically the growth in programmatic you know, in 2018 is expected to be a 28 plus percent growth from, from prior years. And that, that means that the industry isn't going to slow down. This challenge isn't going to go away. And the advertisers that take the time now to protect themselves and, and ultimately start to implement some of the recommendations that I'll walk through here shortly are going to be the ones that benefit the most from their investments in digital. So for the purposes of today's discussion, going from that complex uh, slide that I showed earlier with all the arrows all over it and all the different options, we'll look at it in a more linear format. Um, and to bring back um, you know, what Rob had shown from the WFA research, in the blue portion here, and you'll see the standard 60-40 uh, where 40% reaches a publisher. But in speaking to some of the other technology challenges and pulling from a few other sources, we also wanted to break down some clarity for you about what happens once your ad does get published, whether that's a, a digital on the display ad, a video, so on and so forth. In the red, you know, these are just estimations from other studies, but red takes into account whether or not humans have actually seen your ad and whether or not it was actually viewable. And then purple takes into account, you know, the targeting and, and brand safety sides of things. So, you know, whether or not it was actually viewed by someone that you're looking to target and whether or not it landed on, on a brand safe site or, or a brand that you had whitelisted in the first place. And so the, the amount of challenges as you go through this from just the standard taxes and money flows of the blue section to what ultimately does happen once the ad is out there in the ethos uh, presents a lot to think about. And here in the U.S., you know, as we, as we sat, sat here over the last 18 or 19 months, you know, we decided that we wanted to take a deeper dive into the, the U.S. advertising space with regards to programmatic and, and reach out to some of the Ubiquity's customers, some of Adfin's customers, ANA members and, and ACA members in Canada um, to try to gain access to their actual winning bid log file data um, and try to answer a very simple question. Obviously, that will have a very complex answer, but trying to understand the cost of data and technology fees versus ultimately what, what makes its way to the publishers. So taking the WFA study and estimations that only 40 cents on the dollar would reach the publisher and try to get some, some actual data from actual client log files coming from the DSPs themselves um, to analyze that information leveraging the, the Adfin technology. And what we ended up looking at was about just over 16 billion impressions, which represented uh, about $68 million in U.S. in spend uh, that, that went across five different DSPs over the course of 19 months. Um, we delved into that a bit further and broke out 445 campaigns, whereas we defined a campaign as something with a finite start and end date which ended up representing about 7 billion impressions and about 36 million in spend, uh, which represented, was represented by seven major advertisers uh, and 25 brands within those advertisers. The things that we didn't look at or were, were out of scope for this particular study <clears throat> was some of the things that you saw in red and purple uh, a couple slides back, uh, things like fraud, viewability, brand safety or arbitrage. Um, the supply side portions as well were assumptions and estimates, which you'll see as we break out the study. But those 18 to 19 months was a collaborative effort and could not have been done without our partners, uh, specifically the, the, fa the fantastic technology that Adfin offers to be able to actually analyze the log files from your DSPs, provided that you have access to those log files, and we'll get into some of that 
here with some of the results, as well as the members of the ANA and the ACA um, as being key sponsors for the study and helping us reach out to a variety of advertisers in the U.S. marketplace and, and Canada to try to uh, obtain access to those log files for those particular adver advertisers. And there are some key takeaways to the study itself. Uh, specifically, what we found was that you know, programmatic could be demystified. So you could simplify and start to answer a significant amount of questions, um, provided uh, an as an advertiser you demand control over transactional data, which largely will depend upon the contracts that you have in place as it pertains to uh, the media that you're purchasing programmatically. Um, specifically, as you break down your buys at the highest of levels for programmatic, there's really two types. There's the disclosed model, uh, whereas an, as an advertiser, you'll have access to uh, the, and the ability to audit the fees and the money flows through the process. And then there's the non-disclosed, or in some cases referred to as opt-in agreements. For those of you that might be familiar with the ANA study last year uh, around transparency. Um, and so this study focused on disclosed buying models for obvious reasons. Um, if it was non-disclosed, we, we'd have no access in the first place to that information. And the study did validate many of the concerns from the study conducted by the ANA, Ubiquity, Firm Decisions, and K2 Intelligence around the lack of transparency and programmatic buying. Um, the consequences here, based on the results of our study, are massive. Uh, when you think about the, the amount of money reaching a publisher, which on average in our study, and I'll show you some results here in a moment, uh, was that roughly 58 cents of every disclosed buy on, of every dollar went to the advertiser. So from a simple math standpoint, if we're expecting programmatic investments to to double and by 2019 be about 60 billion in spend, that puts roughly 30 billion dollars globally at risk of being taken out of the process by different taxes and fees. Um, however, what we did find was that the advertisers that focused on success, so going back to the slide that I covered on that, that talked about you know, the CPM models versus things like cost per acquisition. Um, the, the advertisers that had spent more time defining success and then using that definition of success for their, for their campaigns to ultimately guide and control the contracts that they had in place with their media partners were ultimately the advertisers that were able to participate in this study. Um, and, and ultimately had better clarity over the money flows throughout that complex ecosystem. And ultimately what fell from this study was what we call sort of an 11-step playbook um, that will help advertisers like yourselves reach that level of clarity. For those of you um, that, that had a bit of confidence on your programmatic control, you might find some, some new things to think about. For, as we go through those recommendations. For those of you that were lacking confidence, uh, you might find a great starting point for your business and some discussion points to have internally with, with other stakeholders. So from a study standpoint, keeping in mind that this is disclosed buys only and that 95% and of the transactions in our study did not involve an agency trading desk or ATD, we found that on average, for every dollar that went into the machine, roughly 58 cents made its way to the publisher, or would be referred to as working spend. However, you'll notice that that range was pretty drastic, even for disclosed buys, uh, ranging anywhere from 30 cents to 85 cents. And we obviously believe that there, there's a key reason that you see this difference between what we saw for these advertisers and the numbers that Rob presented to you earlier, and that being that this only represents non or this only represents disclosed buys, and only represents well for the most part 95% of this is not being bought through an agency trading desk, and we believe that's where you're seeing the variance and why the average of 58 cents is a bit higher than the 40 cents from the WFA's research. 
the key point here is that even in a disclosed model where advertisers do have the clarity that they need to be able to, to analyze the effectiveness of their programmatic investments, you're still seeing as low as 30 cents on the dollar actually making it to the publishers themselves. Taking this a step further and just giving you a slightly different view, here was where those fees sort of broke out along the way or the different taxes. You know, with roughly 6% on average going to the agency, roughly 12% following, following, falling into the execution fee bucket, about 9% or 9 cents falling into the targeting data, and another 1% in, in other fees. The key point here, right, is that this isn't necessarily a bad breakout. You know, there's always going to be fees or, or taxes for running things programmatically. You know, the key point here is programmatic, when done well, could be very beneficial for your business. And, and you as an advertiser may decide that you are willing to pay a certain level of fees on the dollar for every dollar that you invest programmatically. But the, the challenge or the point and, and what ultimately needs to happen is that as advertisers, you need to be able to make that informed decision. Right? You need to decide whether or not the, how your budget is being allocated as your money flows through the machine is in line with your expectations and that it's creating enough value for you on the other side of the equation with consumers to justify those fees. You know, because ultimately, you know, programmatic offers automation. It's, it simplifies the process. Ideally, it's targeting your consumers in a more effective manner. But at the moment, you know, especially for those of you that might have non-disclosed buys, you know, or in, and particularly might have non-disclosed buys in an agency trading desk, you know, there's quite a bit of risk in place to, that limits your ability to understand true marketing effectiveness and understand going back to that simplistic model, how much of your money is actually going towards or is working dollars towards the placement of your, your ads, and how much money are, is being generated by those ads, or how much success is being generated by those ads in, in the form of a return on investment. Going back to the point I made earlier around uh, mobile and, and video specifically, you can see from our study some of the averages here in the fees or the taxes associated with traditional display versus video. As I mentioned before, you know, video is obviously becoming a, 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 is a medium that continues to be heavily invested in and is continuing to grow alongside mobile investments for mobile advertising. And you'll notice that while the percentage is slightly less from, from a fee standpoint in video compared to display, that because the CPM for video is so much higher, you're actually getting taxed quite a bit on average, or these, these advertisers were being taxed quite heavily for each video placement, and, the, and on average, $3.30 per impression. And in addition to just some of these numbers, you know, there were some other things that we came across that aren't in the numbers that we think are really important for advertisers to be aware of. Um, specifically, when it comes to obstacles for transparency, um, it's important to note that seven advertisers were able to, to actually uh, participate in this study. However, 58 originally were interested. So 88% of those interested in the study were unable to participate as a result of either lack of uh, their contracts and the limitations they're in, or in some cases, you know, just simply not being able to access the information or being discouraged from accessing that information. Um, internally, for the, the advertisers that struggled with gaining access to the log file data to be able to participate in the study, uh, is that escalation paths were unclear. There wasn't, um, in, in many cases, uh, clear ownership um, over the process, and there wasn't a clear delineation of who owned the data. Um, if you go back to a year ago with our uh, the Ubiquity and Firm Decisions recommendations that we launched after the K2 portion of, of the study was, was put out into the marketplace by the ANA, 
one of the things that we outlined in those recommendations was whether in title or function, you know, the need for a chief media officer. You know, someone uh, within the organization who doesn't, doesn't sit on the front lines working with your agency of record, doesn't sit in procurement negotiating the contracts and the fees, but kind of sits right in the middle and, and oversees and, and governs the processes necessary to ensure that the business is protected to the highest uh, degree possible when it comes to the different relationships with your media partners, the contracts that govern that, and ultimately how your media is being bought and how your budgets are being allocated. Uh, another challenge in this industry is, is just the fact that there's really no standardization. In traditional channels like TV, you know, print, radio, you know, we can talk about things like position in pod or GRPs and ratings, and it, it means the same thing. Right, and, and everyone knows what that means. Um, in digital, you know, when you, when you look at the DSPs and specifically the 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 data that exists in the log files, there's no there's no standardization. So every DSP is different. Um, you know, we learned quite a bit around which DSPs have certain information versus which don't. Which log files had more information than others, um, and Obviously, because of that lack of standardization, you know, access to data uh, was very challenging for many of the advertisers. Um, and also, uh, we, as mentioned, you know, had uh, several uh, clients ran into issues where the agencies or the trading desks uh, encouraged advertisers to decline participation for a variety of different reasons. So, overall, you know, there were quite a few obstacles to transparency, but keeping in mind the data that, that was analyzed through the AdFin platform, quite a bit of the learnings that came through uh, you know, as we went through this process and tried to, to get the advertisers access to the data that they needed, we learned quite a bit. And that led to a significant number of recommendations and we believe the, a, a significant path forward to look at this as an opportunity. Uh, for the industry and, and for yourselves, instead of just focusing on the negative. It's so easy to get caught up on the challenges, but we actually believe that there's quite a few solutions, and, and we'll walk through those here in a moment. Uh, but first, want to put a poll up, sort of having walked you through this, this information, uh, to get a litmus test from you on how you're feeling about how, how your organization itself is making progress with regards to media transparency. It would be interesting to, to see the results here and see where many of you sit uh, in this landscape. Exactly. As Bill said, the looking here is uh, in terms of the potential uh, solutions and whether you feel uh, your organization is making progress in terms of improving media transparency. I'm getting sort of uh, some positive messages from some of the work we've been doing recently. We wanted to just get a temperature check on this webinar. While you respond, please don't forget. Um, post your questions as you go through, and we'll allow plenty of time um, for, to put those to Bill uh, at the end of the uh, session. So um, if you could just uh, play this now, Natalia. Lovely. OK, so here we see uh, it's very interesting. A quarter basically saying, yes, making a great deal of progress right now. Um, and just over a half the largest percentage um, saying that they're making some progress, and the balance saying they don't know or not at all. So. Uh, I mean, it's not a huge sample, Bill, but pretty sort of positive <laughs> in terms of where we would have been about 12 months ago, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd say that fits with what we see as well in the industry. I mean, I think, you know, uh, advertisers are, are investing time and, and resource in, in working towards better transparency. You know, I think this struggle is where to start, right, um, and, and where – you know, at the mean, and while you're struggling with where to start, you know, obviously then becomes the fact that you can't just pause all of your investments and, <laughs> and all of your media plans, right? The show must go on. Um, and so in that regard, you know, hopefully for those of you that are making progress and those of you that might be struggling, you know, I'd, I'd uh, encourage you to kind of, as we walk through this checklist and, and provide some insights into what each one means, you know, uh, sort of tick the box um, and, and which ones you feel good, good about versus which ones maybe should be a focus. And hopefully these recommendations will, will sort of set the course for you here over the next few months on, on things to think about and, and, and things to move forward on to continue down that path towards better transparency and, and accountability. Um, you know, because ultimately, you know, we'll break this into a few categories, sort of starting with brand safety. 
I think the, the interesting thing, um, you know, given sort of the landscape that we discussed early on and, and some of the findings with the study is that there's really two sides of the coin to focus on when it comes to digital. On the one side, you have the, you know, increasing, you know, the amount of working dollars that reach the publisher. On the other side, you have sort of ensuring that the publishers themselves that those working dollars are going to is going in front of the right audience, is going in front of humans, and is being targeted appropriately based upon the rules that you're setting for your programmatic ads. And so when it comes to, to brand safety, you know, the, the first step is really thinking through and creating a whitelist of approved sites. There's been a lot in the news um, you know, across specific channels and, and some of the publishers out there. Um, and a, not all of, but a lot of the issues that you're seeing in the news can be solved for by implementing uh, technology to, to ensure that you have a white list of approved sites that you want your content to end up on. Um, it's also important internally to review any of your non-disclosed buying situations. So similar to the ANA study that we did a year ago, sort of, you know, and, and bringing to light the uh, confusion uh, between the relationship as an advertiser with your media partners, either being an agent relationship where they're buying media on your behalf in your best interests, or the principal relationship, which does show up quite a bit in digital and in non-disclosed buys, whereas the, your media partners are aggregating or buying media and then selling it back to you that, that may or may not be in your best interests. It's really important to know as you go across the organization and the different buy orders that are being made within your individual brands, which ones are disclosed versus non-disclosed. So you can have a good understanding of, of where your money may or may not be conflicted. And also, you know, going back to success, and we'll get to some of this in a few slides, but it's important to think about the fact that brand safety should be synonymous with successful campaigns. It should be part of your success metric or key performance indicators or KPIs that you build out for the different campaigns that, that you're putting into the marketplace. Then there's verification um, and, and ensuring that you've, you've applied this appropriately against all of your digital campaigns as they, as they go out into the marketplace. And we think that there's really sort of two things that advertisers need to do as you launch campaigns uh, digitally into the marketplace. One is setting deadlines uh, with your media partners to verify all of the media that you're purchasing from a, a, for those particular digital campaigns. And then more specifically, having folks internally on your side that are verifying or bringing in you know, third-party independent partners that can then work with you to verify and review all of those campaigns. You know, there's this concept, and I'll get to it in a moment, of, of trusting. You know, every relationship is built on trust, and the same is to be said for the media partners that you're engaging with and, and, and ultimately trusting with your media budgets, which in many cases are some of the largest budgets in the organization. And there needs to be an element of trust and verification to ensure that that trust is, is maintained and that your campaigns are being stewarded in the best way possible, in the most effective way for your business. You also need to think through and establish a variety of principles around transparency. More specifically, as an organization, you really need to have, uh, and whether this is a chief media officer or you know, someone that's currently in your organization that's very involved in, in the media buying process and, and the relationships with your media partners, so you need to have a strategy for what transparency means for you. Uh, similar to the word digital that has so many different meaning, meanings depending on who you're talking to or, or what the topic is, you know, transparency is a word that has many definitions as well. And it's really important for your business to define what transparency means for your business where you're willing to perhaps enter into a non-disclosed buy versus where you're not. Um, you know, even from a relationship standpoint, you know, who, which media partners you might be willing to engage in a principal relationship with versus those that you insist on an agent relationship. And ultimately then take that strategy and apply it to your contracts. 
it does not end with contracts, but it starts there. If you don't have, if you have not reviewed your contracts, if you have not updated those contracts in the last couple of years, then that's an area of focus immediately for your industry, or for your for your business, to shape those contracts to leverage things like the uh, ANA uh, and ISBA, uh, as well as the double ANA in Australia's you know contract templates that have been put out there as a guide for for advertisers to restructure your media relationships, and then ultimately ensure that once those contracts are in place, that you have the right process and governance in place to control it and to verify at each step of the way that that trust is being maintained and that your transparency level is being maintained across the entire business. Measurement and data was the largest section of our ANA recommendations last year. And there, the reason for that is because data and whoever owns that data ultimately controls the power. Um, and, and data itself is really becoming a currency in this industry. As I mentioned before, there's over 5,000 different technology options when it comes to buying programmatically and measuring your digital effectiveness and the campaign's you know, effectiveness that you're putting out into the marketplace. And there's a variety of data inputs that are either coming and being fed into the planning process each year for your business, the performance analysis of each campaign, or even from an optimization standpoint as, as you feed information in to better target your consumers going forward as you learn more about them along the way. Advertisers must focus on this category and must ensure that you as advertisers own the data about your consumers and the data about your campaigns and that you have access to the right level of data not only to be able to conduct the analysis that that exists in in the study that we launched with adfin you know around the programmatic investments that we walked through earlier but also to be able to verify and validate you know whether or not these campaigns themselves are successful and ensuring that you're receiving third-party unbiased access to that data to be able to, to, to trust that you know what's working and what isn't for your business. And as it comes to measurement, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, but there really needs to be some thought given to some of the industry standard metrics that are out there for things like viewability, um, things like uh, uh, reach and, and how to measure leads. And, you know, and ultimately, we think that there should be some improvements um, and, and much stricter guidelines for what viewable means across both video and display, as well as switching from impressions to measure reach, but in thinking about unique viewable reach. So actual human traffic and the number of, of humans you've uniquely reached based on the, the campaign that you've put out in the marketplace. And we also think that instead of looking at cost per action, so immediately you know, attributing any action on .com to a digital campaign, I think that attribution needs to be thought through and, and, and using a bit more data science to attribute you know, cost per conversion to the digital channel versus other channels you may be investing in like TV or, or uh, print or radio or out of home that could be playing into the actions that you're seeing on, on the website or in your stores or, or what have you. And we also think that you know, when it comes to success, as we mentioned before, the advertisers in the study, the seven out of the, the 58 that were able to participate to the level of granularity required for this study, um, were the ones that had thought through what quality actually meant and what success meant for their campaigns. And this might be a good starting point for those of you that, that didn't know where to start or, or uh, have, a, have less confidence in your programmatic investments. But working with your business to define a broad set of KPIs focused on quality that extends beyond just simply what was delivered versus bought and looks at you know, technical fees, looks at brand safety, fraud, viewability, and sets benchmarks for what success for a particular campaign looks like. So for example, going back to our adjusted uh, viewability metric for a display ad, perhaps you incentivize the agency to maintain 
you know, uh, viewability at a level of, of over 70% of the ad seen for three seconds instead of the 50% of the ad for one second, which is basically the blink of an eye. So giving some thought to how you want to measure success and how you want to define success could be a great starting point for, for those of you that are looking to get started because doing that would then define what type of data you need. It would then define the contracts to ensure you have access to that data. And then it would in, it put the appropriate incentives in place that can be independently measured to ensure that your campaigns are being stewarded appropriately by your media partners. And that then will fine tune itself by then using that information, using those KPIs to also select the right uh, technology vendors from that massive Lumiscape I showed earlier. And ultimately will dictate what data you need access to and when and from what source which will then drive all of the contracts that you have with your media partners going forward. But finally, uh, before turning things over to questions, um, it's really important that as advertisers, you use your buying power to capitalize on this opportunity and change the industry. You know, this industry would not exist if it wasn't for the budgets that all of your businesses are putting into the marketplace. And it's important that as advertisers, you join up and you use that buying power to redefine the industry, to redefine what success is for this industry, and ultimately capitalize on this opportunity and this turning point in the industry right now to, to make it better for everyone um, and to create a higher level of transparency, accountability, and ultimately measurement so that every dollar that you're putting in to your marketing investments can be followed through the chain and, and you can sit there and confidently understand the effectiveness of those marketing dollars and what that ROI ultimately is. And with that, I want to thank everyone for making the time today and, and we'll turn things over to any questions that, that you might have as we, as we look to wrap up today's webinar. Absolutely. Thank you, Bill. Really, really excellent um, presentation. Your voice reminds me of an actor, but I can't remember which one at the moment. But anyway, <laughs> you did a great <laughs> job. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Um, so, uh, yeah, please post your questions in the Q&A widget if you have any. We've had a few that have come through. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to start on um, one from me. Uh, you talked a lot about measurement, and we also talk a lot about the sort of challenges in our industry of proxy metrics, which perhaps often aren't hugely well defined. Do you see as ubiquity and given your um, your uh, your background um, do you see a real sort of shift from people moving to those proxy, from those proxy metrics to sort of attribution um, metrics or modeling or because obviously it's quite a challenge for a lot of our members in that space to we do sort of polls amongst them there's quite a few say actually we just don't know yet have you seen a shift there at all Definitely a shift, but also a struggle, right? I mean, I yeah. think you, you just highlighted it, Rob. It, it's, it's not easy. Um, you know, solving the attribution equation um, is not easy. There's technology limitations. I mean, candidly, that's why we launched our, our own attribution platform uh, a couple weeks ago into the marketplace, um, you know, because it, it needs to be more consultative and people-focused. I think a lot of the technology that's out there for attribution um, requires data in a very specific format and the runway to value to produce results in, in some cases that we've seen for clients is just too long. Um, you know, in, in, in cases where data might not exist or where advertisers might not have access to that information. Um, but we're definitely seeing a, a, an upward trend of uh, conversations around you know, be it econometric modeling or, or attribution specifically focused on digital, um, and working towards having the right tech and data strategy to, to ensure that, that advertisers have access to the right information to be able to start to answer those questions. But it's definitely best approached in, a, in what, what I like to call a crawl, crawl, walk, run approach, right? So, you know, simply starting by defining success um, instead of jumping right into trying to understand attribution is usually a better place for advertisers that might be starting a little bit more on the, the less mature scale versus those that have been doing and putting a lot of rigor into data that might be ready to, to jump right into attribution. Okay, no, thank you. But but it's Kevin Bacon. It came to me. That's who your voice reminds me. <laughs> 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 so anyway, shifting back from Hollywood um, to uh, one of the questions that came through just obviously had can last week, and um, I'm not going to name names, but a lot of talk around sort of measurement on the biggest uh, digital platforms out there, and a lot of members struggling with that, whether it be to do with um, 
uh, brown safety or other areas. How do you uh, propose our members sort of address their concerns in these areas in relation to those uh, those big digital platforms specifically? Sure. No, and that's a great question. And you know, I think it's great that these topics are coming up um, and being talked about on big stages. Um, you know, it, it shows how much effort advertisers are starting to put in and uh, into this issue over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, you know, I think this goes back to my point earlier about trust but verify, right? Um, I see all the time as we you know begin work with with new clients or you know having conversations with potential clients. You know, there's a lot of data that's out there um, that clients are receiving and sometimes receiving from the students themselves in situations where students are grading their own papers, right? Um, the fox and the hen house scenario, to use another, more, another analogy. Um, and I think, you know, trust but verify is, is the answer here. Um, being able to analyze or interrogate and validate the data that's being provided what, re, with regards to viewability uh, brand safety, um, performance, um, instead of just accepting the numbers at face value um, as, as these campaigns are being reported or the success of those campaigns are being reported is very important. Um, it goes back to data in general and, and, and the comments that I made earlier around you know, data being the currency in this industry. You know, advertisers that will be the most successful. Um, in, in not only transparency, but being able to measure the effectiveness of their marketing dollars will be the ones that invest the time and effort in building a solid data strategy and ensuring that they have act, unfettered access to the, to the information that they need. And, and this you know, caters to the walled garden scenario as well and some of the issues that have been in the news over the last six months, six to eight months. Um, you know, with, with some of the social platforms and, and things of that nature out there where, you know, numbers are being reported and, and they're, they're unable to be audited and they're taken at face value. And you come to find later that there was issues with those metrics. Um, you know, so that's where the trust but verify comes into play. And I think that's, you know, for advertisers that are asking those questions, that's where they need to focus their efforts first. Okay, fantastic. We're almost out of time, um, but I've got one last question which has been posted up. Obviously, it's um, traditionally uh, advertisers with limited resources have relied heavily on their agencies, as they still do, of course. But um, mm -hmm. when you're talking about appointing a chief media officer, um, someone asked the question, just when is not every market is as big as the U.S., of course, um, and perhaps you know, you're know you not part of a global organization. What do you recommend to marketers in perhaps smaller markets that don't have the uh, funds mm -hmm. to appoint a chief media officer? And please don't say yeah, and I, ubiquity because that would that sound like a horrible pitch. <laughs> yeah, no, we're, yeah, we're not we're not here to pitch today. We're here to educate, right? I think you know it's a good question, and I think that's why um, even in the recommendations we referred to it by role or by function. Chances are that every organization already has somebody that's kind of playing this role or trying to. All right, I think the biggest issue for organizations is that the person playing that role might need a bit more education on the landscape. Um, you know, for those, you know, so it doesn't necessarily require an investment in a new person or a lofty title, uh, which obviously would bring a lofty salary. Um, but it might just simply be investing in education um, and using some of the resources available, you know, published by, you know, organizations like yourselves at the WFA, you know, pu published by the ANA, the ACA, you know, so on and so forth. You know, there's so much information out there now around transparency and accountability. And I think, you know, regardless of investment or, or size of, of advertiser or market, you know, it really comes down to the advertisers leaning in a bit and using the resources that they have and the resources publicly available through, you know, the great industry bodies like yourselves to better educate their teams, to create more awareness around the challenges, many of which we talked about today, and then using that to, to better guide the conversations and the contracts that you're putting in place with your media partners. You, know, you don't need to go out and hire a chief media officer if you don't have the budget, but you do need to invest in the right level of clarity and, and education for the folks that you might have on the front lines managing those media partner relationships. And I think that's really the key takeaway. It's not to go out and spend a bunch of money. It's to think about how to best leverage what you have and the resource that you have available to you in the most optimal way given the challenges that are faced in the digital landscape today.
Fantastic. It turned from a picture of a victim to a picture of the WFA and our national associations. Did you see what I did there? That was very good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Partnership. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. If you want to continue the discussion, obviously, we're going to be hosting meetings uh, around the world. For those of you, uh, as I said, on the right-hand side of the map, we'll be in Shanghai uh, doing a media transformation session, so very relevant with our media and our marketing procurement colleagues on the 12th of July. Um, and but uh, not just in China, we'll be doing meetings elsewhere. So just remains uh, for me to say thank you very much. Uh, Bill, excellent job. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity. No problem. And for those of you who want to reach out to either Bill or myself, uh, you can see our email address is there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and wish you an excellent rest of the day. Take care. <laughs>